It's my second time in Ljubljana. I really like your city and thank you for being invited. And, and I'm very really impressed by, by the audience. Okay, how many of you are physicians? Right. So that's, uh, and not that I have anything about researchers, but uh, usually it's difficult to, to get a big enough audience of physicians on cannabis talks because people are still waiting to see what their friends are doing and they are not sure and then many of our, my colleagues still believe cannabis is some kind of a voodoo and not a, a, a real uh, option. Uh, I was just retired so my institute is not anymore on the slides, just my, just my uh, university, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Betty is from the, the Technion which is much Lower level university. <laughs> I think it's, it's fascinating for us as physicians to, to find out that there are so many uh, medical conditions that uh, are being uh, treated by cannabis, and for one side we say uh, it can't be. <clears throat> what, what is it? Is, is it the next steroid or whatever? And, and I think maybe uh, Daddy's talk gave you some insight of how many unknown cascades <coughs> and different receptors and negative uh, activity and positive activity uh, are taking place in this whole game of cannabis in, in the different medical conditions. So like just just like just show you how many areas of uh, the brain has cannabis receptors and that's why there are so many neurological diseases that we think it might help and it, it's really complex one. Uh, the talk is, is uh, a talk that uh, the first time I give it because David said uh, nobody gets a plane ticket to Ljubljana if he doesn't bring comes with two talks. So this is the <laughs> the first time, and I, I think it's, it's important some of you maybe already started, some of you may be thinking about starting to treat your patients, and of course half an hour talk will not be enough, but it will give you some insight how to start. And then I'm, I'm about four years in, in the medical cannabis field, Johnny, who will talk later in the afternoon, is close to 10 years. So you, you know, learn every new thing every day. It's, it's like in other fields of medicine. So this talk will give you just the basics. Uh, the second thing is that I'm going to give you the slides. Uh, Professor Neuberwell is in charge that everybody is, uh, wants to copy the slides and take it. So I don't care that if, if, um, if you take pictures, but if you want the slides, you can get it. We already talked about 144 cannabinoids, and we know that uh, already know that many of them have different roles or have the same role in in some part of um, medical conditions. And we also know that there are not only cannabinoids; there are also terpenoids and also flavonoids, and the net effect in the end is probably the entourage, the effect of some uh, component together. And as physicians, <coughs> we are trying to gather information, but for you as starters, uh, it's too much. And uh, the basic rules to start with, I'm not talking about the researchers, the physicians who's going to, going to start treating patients, uh, it's, the information is too complex, and you have just to know how many players you have in this game, but actually uh, we basically will try to understand the, the role of s only few of them, because otherwise, uh, you know, as physicians, our brain is not so uh, developed. So, so, for example, 
I'll, I'll show you a game that I've once played with myself uh, before one of my talks. So, as Daddy mentioned, in Israel, most physicians don't really understand what they are doing when they write the prescription. And then they go to the growers, and the growers have the nurses. In other countries, for example, uh, Canada, there are dispensaries, so there are the pharmacists, also in, the, in many places in the US. So, the guy you are talking to as a patient is not your physician. The physician is the one who says, yeah, I think cannabis may help you. Yeah, I think I write down his prescriptions. But then you go to the grower, and as they said, there are 95 different strains in Israel. And this specific grower has like 20 strains. And you say, OK, I have a glioblastoma. And I heard, they told me I'm going to die in half a year. Uh, how can you help me? Which, which strain? The, the patient doesn't know that there are different strains. But, and he says, well, I think you may start with A or B. So I called three of these nurses for a specific disease. Uh, and then I gave Daddy uh, the names of the cannabinoids that they use, the strains. And uh, you see that uh, nurse number one said that uh, he is using these two strains, and they are quite similar for this specific disease. Nurse number two used strain three or four, which are different in, uh, in the percentage of the cannabinoids but there was a big similarity uh, between <coughs> the uh, combination of cannabinoids. You can see it in this table. And nurse number three from a third company, he gave me, uh, he says, I'm starting with this train, and it's completely, completely different uh, from what the other two companies were offering the, the patients. So if you are using strains, you can get results, but you only now start slowly, slowly, because Daddy has also only five PhDs, only slowly you start to understand what really happens. So as physicians that we want to help our patients, we need to know that we are somewhere in the black. We, we, we are trying to help without really understanding. I think uh, that's about the picture. Currently, uh, you know, there were strains that were abandoned. Companies decided to go new strains. So I, I, would, I would say that I think there are worldwide about 5,000 strains being used, maybe more than that. And we know that in each strain there are about between 70 to 100 components. And I would say that there are close to 50 medical conditions that currently physicians worldwide are trying to help the patients uh, with cannabis. <laughs> so uh, what do we do? There is also different individual difference between the patients, as Tanja said, Tanja said before. So, as a physician, what would you do? You have patient A with uh, disease B, and you read and you heard that cannabis may help. <coughs> and then, what, what, which strain would you give So there are some basic rules uh, in, in the way that I'm working with, and maybe it will help you. Uh, in order to make it more complex, it's another example of co complexity. There is uh, one of the largest uh, cannabis company in Canada, it's called Tilway. And Tilway is selling strains, and they have about, uh, strains, and they have about 90 different strains. So now they uh, decided to put some of the money that they are making into research. And they uh, uh, gathered 
1,800 patients with migraines. And they gave one PhD to do the research and he collected uh, uh, the strains that they were using. So these 1,800 patients used 40 different strains. Now, when you use a strain, uh, and you go to somebody who, in the field, he says, usually you start with some strain, and then you think maybe it's not the best one for you, you go to another strain, and then maybe you uh, combine them, maybe you add a third strain, and then you come to what is known in our world, the sweet spot. No phonography, sweet spot for cannabis. And the time to get to this sweet spot is between three and six months. So uh, when you want to harvest the data, as that he's doing, we, we have to wait until the patient gets to his sweet spot and he says, in this uh, pharmacy, I, after a few months of trial and error, I decided the combination of strain A and strain C is the best for me. And this, then you, you can uh, put it in your data. So uh, they found that they, uh, the, these 1,800 patients were using 40 strains, and they said, okay, we, we should not go for the cannabinoid, we should go for the terpenes, and they put it only in the database, and there was nothing significant. There was no group of terpenes that were more common in the strains that were used. So it's even more complicated than uh, what we think. So uh, then he showed you the matrix. Uh, it's, it's still, even if you get to the matrix, it's still not the whole way to the solution. It's part way. So uh, I'm going to quote from uh, somebody who is very known in our world of cannabis, Ethan Russo. And, uh, and now I'm going to narrow down all the big complex picture that I was bringing <coughs> to only two cannabinoids, THC and CBD, because these are the cannabinoids we know most about them. <coughs> We already know about CBG, CBD, CBDV, and uh, THCA uh, that they help, but most of the papers that you will encounter when you do the PubMed uh, are concerning CBD and THC, and it, um, you can see from this uh, slide from Ita Russo that uh, for many uh, conditions, uh, they, they can have both, they have some activity, uh, and one will have more activity for one condition, one will have more for another. So uh, sometimes the combination of both might work. That's another slide of the same team. What happens when we go to our clinic? That was my part of the introduction. Uh, I would say that don't look at this cohort, is, this is for investors or for companies. Where, where is the big money is? But this is what happens in Israel. Uh, just a small correction for Daddy. Uh, altogether, during the last 10 years, I think close to 75,000 licenses were given. And currently, there are 42,000 uh, people are using, uh, actively using cannabis. And in Israel, these are the percentage of, of the different diseases that people are using. Uh, you see that the main two are pain and cancer. And when you say cancer, it's not what we are talking about today, but about the other sides of the cancer medicine, about the loss of appetite, and about the vomiting when you give chemotherapy. And um, I, I don't know if exactly the numbers of people who get it just to reduce the cancer tissue. Psychiatry, uh, we are afraid that THC will uh, aggravate some of the disease or maybe will cause it to, uh, to start. So currently in Israel, I think only PTSD we use cannabis for, but from the psychi psychiatrists that I meet, uh, they said that for PTSD, uh, it's a real help, real help. Uh, I'm a pneumatologist, so only 2% of this 
42 thousands are patients with epilepsy and about the same percent of patients with autism, which is all new. Autism is like three years, started in Israel and all, all, the, all the knowledge worldwide is coming from Israel. So, and pain itself, uh, there are like 30 different you know, types of pain, and I'm not going into it. An example in just one field, neurology, how many conditions, uh, I accept that autism is psychiatry, never mind, how many conditions in just a specific medical field are currently being treated in many countries with cannabis. So there were some reviews and the reviews were trying to use uh, RCTs, randomized control uh, trials. Usually, the companies that grow strains do not have enough money to invest in RCTs, but still, uh, also in this uh, JAMA analysis, it showed that in chronic pain and spasticity does have uh, substantial evidence that it does work and there was a low quality evidence for other situations. There's another study that was trying to do the same, more recent, and they found out that this is meta-analysis of many, many studies, right? So, uh, that pain in adults, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting in, in uh, constipation, and spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, uh, there is enough evidence to show that it does help. And there is a lesser level of evidence to show that there is improvement also in appetite, to weight, uh, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, reducing cancer tissue, IBDs, uh, and epilepsy. So uh, the whole variety of medical conditions, that there is evidence today <coughs> that cannabis uh, is working. So as I said before, you are the physician, and then you, let's say, the regulation in your country allows you to write a prescription. So you write a prescription. Usually, you are not the one who decide what will the patient will be given. Uh, but I'm trying to teach you a little bit what are the rules, and maybe you'll be such a physician that you'll be also interfering with uh, deciding together with the patient about what cannabis would he get either strains or some other formulation and to understand what is the accumulated evidence so far. So in Israel only 10% are physicians of these sites and in, in our country is the nurses who are, being, uh, who are working for the eight growers and in other countries are the pharmacists. So cardiac disease is um, you might have problems, it may uh, interfere with cardiac function. Uh, in Israel, uh, I think also in other psychiatric uh, disorders, they do not allow, not in pregnant women, of course, uh, and not in patients that used to have cannabis abuse before when they uh, took it for recreation. You don't want it to. Uh, uh, one of my patients, I had to stop it because he became abused, and uh, now we're starting again uh, with my threat that if anybody will give him some THC, that's the last time I write prescription for him. So now everybody knows that uh, this guy can get only CBD. So this is uh, this slide is is not a, a, a new testament. This is something that I gathered from, from several papers <laughs> and from my experience. And it could be some kind of a basic guideline, but uh, you, 
cannot say, hey, Kramer says this is the maximum, because this is not. Because I didn't have time and energy to go for all the papers on each condition uh, and uh, to do a meta-analysis just to give you uh, uh, the concept. And the concept is actually two parts. One part is what is accepted to give to a specific disease, and then the doses. So you can see that most papers that were writing about, or at least some papers that I have read about some disease, uh, chemotherapy-induced uh, nausea and vomiting, mostly THC. Quotes, quotes, some are saying THC, some are saying CBD. It's a complicated story. I will, I will not go into it now. Fibromyalgia, some don't believe it helps. Those who do believe it helps give mainly THC. Dementia, mainly THC. And that's another story. Uh, do you want to treat the the Alzheimer uh, behavioral problem, or do you want to give a long-term treatment uh, for Alzheimer, which nobody does it today, only on mice, and then if you think it's inflammatory in the mechanism, so you should give CBD, because basically CBD is, is better for inflammatory uh, processes. To wet THC, epilepsy, <coughs> Either CBD or CBD in which we shall talk about the difference in my second talk today. Uh, autistic spectrum disorder, CBD in which, pain THC in which. So you see there are some basic rules for different medical conditions. What would be the doses? And again, I'm quoting Ethan Russo. Start low, go up slow, and try not to go too high. Sometimes you cannot do it because of tolerance and, and, and <coughs> uh, receptors are being changed, etc. So the numbers you see here is not uh, the starting dose, uh, uh, the maximum doses, and, but you always start slow. Because if you have a patient with um, pain for the last few years, and suddenly you get uh, hold of, of cannabis, you don't have to come to a solution in the first two weeks. I mean, you can just hold yourself uh, two or three months to go up slowly, and in order to, to find the right strain, the right components, and, and the right dose, without <coughs> the so many side effects. As physicians, I, I um, regard cannabis as another medication, just with higher chance of being efficacious. There are side effects for THC and CBD, and we should go over that later. So it's not, it's not an innocent. So first of all, it's, it's not going to work for everybody, and second, it is not the holy grail. It has side effects, and some of your patients will have to abandon the cannabis because of the side effects. For autistic patients, they give much less, it's mostly CBD, and they give a uh, lesser dose. Uh, CBD, uh, when uh, we wrote a brochure for uh, Australia, we said that the maximum total daily dose is uh, 1,000 milligram. Total daily <coughs> dose. But CBD has lower side effects than THC. The maximum I gave was 800 today. THC, I would select, let's calculate the, the, the Israeli numbers, because I think I have to avoid this one. Uh, the average uh, THC flowers that a patient in Israel is being given is about 35 grams a month. If you divide it to 30 days, so it's about one <coughs> gram a day. Now, in this flowers that they sell in uh, Israel, the amount of THC is about 10%. So the average dose of THC is about uh, 100 milligram per day in Israel. But there are patients that are getting, being given in Israel, uh, five times more. 
So you can go and uh, in one of the lectures of somebody who was treating Tourette, she uh, uh, showed numbers like of 10 times more. So in the THC, there is all the tolerance effect, and the, the fact that you have to increase doses with the time. Maybe uh, Johnny will talk about it later because he has more experience with THC. But the numbers, uh, I would say, that will be the maximum numbers, not the average number. And usually, you start as slow as possible. So there are a lot of uh, ways to deliver the, this medication, these plants, to your patients. And it depends also about the age and the habits of the patient. I would say grown-up will prefer to smoke, but uh, today many of us, not all of us, believe that smoke is more dangerous to your lungs because of the combustion uh, derivatives after the combustion of the heating of the stuff. So any uh, companies today in the, in the U.S. Uh, mainly, but not only, uh, selling some kind of vapor, vape uh, that you can uh, have exact dose of being given and you don't have to count on your how much you inhale, like in you know the, the old inhaler of asthma, you don't really know how much is, is being uh, getting into your lungs. But with this one, each time you press, you know exactly how many microgram or milligram, um, and then you can go start with one a day, then go twice a day, and then in uh, uh, each time go up from one to two to maybe ten in the morning and ten in the evening, and you can actually control the amount that you're being given. There is also sprays that uh, you spray into your uh, oral cavity. Uh, and for the children, we usually, and that's what we do today with uh, <coughs> most of the strains in epilepsy, you use oil and put the oil sublingual. Uh, but for example, the Sativex uh, for uh, spasticity, they use this kind of spray. Some of the delivery we should do it short. Uh, you, you can uh, exactly know how much you give. Some of them you can say, um, averagely, uh, I'm not sure it's so important. It's maybe important with small kids, but if a grown up is ending up with uh, 10 uh, inhalations or 12 inhalations, it's not, or, or cigarettes, uh, I don't think it's so important. We talked about the, the fact that the method of administration is. Uh, it actually uh, determines the extent of absorption. The difference between reps and, and inhalation is mostly uh, the danger, the small danger of, of having uh, cancer, lung cancer after many years. <laughs> and the bioavailability of CBD in smoking is very similar to THC. We are going to see some pharmacokinetics profiles. Uh, this is from a lab of Professor Hustis, and it shows that if you inhale after less than 10 minutes, you get the peak. But very shortly after, the amount in your blood goes down. So if people inhale, sometimes they need like six or eight times a day. We say that uh, we prefer sublingual instead of peros. Uh, and why is that? Because by uh, having the stuff delivered sublingual, you actually uh, bypass the first hepatic cycle, which supposedly reducing the blood level of the stuff. But frankly, I could not find any paper uh, that actually demonstrating how much the bioavailability is going down with the subliminal. So in Israel, everybody is taking subliminal, uh, but I'm not so sure how important it is. Everybody says it's important, it's, it's preferable to, to pro us, but I couldn't see the, couldn't see the evidence. The same, uh, no, that's another study, and they used uh, subliminal THC and CBD, 
And now it's not minutes. The first one was minutes. Now it's hours. It comes to the peak is about three, four hours, both for THC and CBD. So if you give some liquid, uh, you have to give it twice or three times a day. We give three times a day, but I talked to one uh, pharmacist in, uh, in Jerusalem University, the Hebrew University, and she told me that recently they, they did a study and showed that twice a day is also as good. So also with this um, simple rules, we don't have clear rules. And you can uh, see from this uh, summarizing slide that the onset is, of course, much shorter with smoking. If you go with your... Can you get cannabis here in Vienna? Is it possible to get cannabis here? No, cannabis no, no, no. no, no. no, no. no, no. cannabis So, okay, if you go to Amsterdam with your friend and you are smoking, but your friend doesn't like to smoke and he take a cookie, you have to realize that you'll be happy after 10 minutes and he will uh, be angry about you the whole first hour, only then he will be happy. <laughs> so, it's important. Time it goes to the maximum, smoking is like after 15 to 20 minutes, uh, in the post to several hours uh, to oral. Uh, and omicosal is somewhere in the middle. And the duration, uh, I did not find, or we, we the physician, we would like to talk about T half. I did not find T half numbers for cannabis of any of the deliveries. So this is. Uh, table is pretty primitive, but that's everything that I uh, succeeded to get. So this, this but it still may help those of you going to start. So that's what I said before, start low, go slow, stay low. If you uh, look at the protocols of the companies, the pharma companies, they always go for shorter times because they want to save money. And that's why they also go for a shorter uh, maximum dose, lower maximum dose, and that's why often the trial does not succeed. So, but if you have a patient in your clinic and he can call you once every two or three weeks, you can go slowly. Uh, I, I think in my epilepsy clinic, uh, usually the patient time is two to three months. <coughs> And then if you like using uh, sprays, so you, once a day one spray, and then twice a day one spray, and then you go up with the number of sprays until the, and you can calculate the maximum dose, and that's how you uh, uh, explain to your patient what would be the maximum, and as in any other medication, go for halfway, see what are the side effects, see the efficacy, too many side effects, you don't go higher, you even quit. If there are no side effects, but you think it's not efficacious enough, you go up. We do the same as with any other medication in any other field. Uh, and these are starting dose of each one, it's per day. Uh, the starting dose for either the THC or the CBD. And the CBD, which is the one that I'm using, it is not free of side effects. And some of the patients stop medication even if it works because of the side effects. So the main side effects of CBDs are somnolence, and then some may have diarrhea, fatigue, decreased appetite. So some of them, either from the because of the diarrhea and because of decreased appetite, they lose weight. And even if that is it, uh, cannabis, some of them may be more aggressive or more irritable. And then there is all the rest. I think we, I have a list of about 20 adverse reactions for CBD. But the good thing is that none, all were reversible within 24 hours. And CBD, you can stop from one day to another. Usually I go for about one or two weeks of washout, but you can, if you want, if you need, you can stop from one day to another. 
And even the <coughs> single person that has psychosis, it disappeared after 30 hours. So you'll get the slides later. We are not going to go over that. It's that you can see uh, much, many more side effects. And if you treat the elderly uh, patient, maybe Johnny will talk about it. Um, there are specific side effects for the elderly. Pharmacokinetics, you have these slides also. Uh, with, these are only, all, also the, the, the drug drug interactions that we are uh, important for us as epileptologists. And you should know that there is also tolerance, and I'll talk about the tolerance uh, later in my next second talk. And I think for, for the first one is enough. Questions? Uh, you showed in one, in one of your slides that bioavailability of smoking is 25%, by oral ingestion is about 15%, and oral mucosa, the, the number is missing. And I'm wondering, could you compare? And also no, I couldn't. I looked for the numbers, I couldn't. And you also have to realize that I, I you wrote, I read about five papers on each of these topics, and the numbers were very diverse, mm -hmm. so I gave you like kind of the average. But for sublingual, I could not find the. the uh, it's interesting. Wouldn't, wouldn't that information be con uh, in the SPC? Because uh, it's a drug, and normally drug drugs, uh, medicines, registered medicines have that information in the SPC part. Of the so. Uh, the okay. So that's regulation. GW. Is doing pharmacokinetics. They have no more money and longer time. Uh, the companies, the startups, the small companies that sell strains, sometimes the regulation allow them to go straight to phase two, uh, and they don't have to do the pharmacokinetics. So I did not find it, or maybe they have it in the files of the company, mm -hmm. but it's not in the public. And what happens in stomach in acidic uh, environment? How susceptible is uh, our cannabinoids to acidic? Presentation. Are there any, any specific interactions in not only in epilepsy but all fields that we we have to be warned about uh, with any other drugs, say, uh, any cancer, etc. Uh, there is a whole list on my slide. Is only the drugs that are concerning uh, epilepsy. So cannabis is actually CBD. Sorry. CBD is uh, being metabolized through the P450. P Some of these enzyme complexes. But uh, when they did studies on, on epilepsy and those entities <coughs> that bothered to, uh, to check the blood level of, of other concomitant drugs, they found out that only clobazam is significantly increased. And together with vaporic acid, the uh, liver enzymes may go up too high. And the rest, there is some changes, but uh, not non significant clinical. And for the rest of the indication, I, I don't know. My name is uh, Tanya Petrizhnik, and I'm coming from uh, the Oops Cannabis NGO. And I would like to give all the compliments to your lecture, because this is a topic that I believe in this country is not spread enough. So my question is, um, I'm sure that you have noticed that sometimes when a patient is using uh, cannabis and being satisfied with the effects of the strength he's using, um, does it appear that people question why this cannabis that is useful most of the time sometimes has a different kind of effect on them? If, if this is happening? Oh, it, it does happen. For example, uh, there are side effects that you can see it in 1%, and you don't know why specifically this patient has it. Uh, THC for low numbers, low doses, because we used for epilepsy 21, but one of my, the children I was treating, I was very happy every time, two hours after having the, the oil. So of course the THC, the small amount of THC for him, it was good enough to make him real happy. So, 
basically I don't have the research. But it's side effects are specific as well as a efficacy. Does it happen that this same patient that is always happy has an episode of not being happy with the same thing he's using? In continuation to Betty's uh, talk, sometimes when they switch the strain, and the strain has this same specific ratio of THC, CBD to THC 21, and everything crash. And you, you get a phone call in the morning, the whole night the child was seizing. It was the same 21. Maybe I can say from my own experience. So I have a strain that I like, that I usually use when I need the effects of it. And but sometimes it, it happens that this strain doesn't give me the same effects that I usually expect. The same batch? The same harvest? The, the same flower okay. from... Okay. So that's not a topic that would be looked into it till now. I, I don't have enough experience to answer that, but maybe Johnny will be able to do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.